I felt that he helped clarify that to the medical profession and to the scientists of the world as perhaps one of the first ones to do, to do that. That was one of the things that I meant in that. Mr. Sanger, do you uh, disagree that Catholics, or do you, do you feel that Catholics should not have a right to have a say when a city administration contemplates spending their tax dollars on birth control or the dissemination of birth control information, something that Catholics believe is sinful? That they have a right to say what they... Do you feel that they don't have a right to have a say when a city administration contemplates spending their dollars, tax dollars, on birth control? For instance, here in New York, Catholics comprise about 45% of our population. They're the largest single group. Well, don't you think they should have the democratic right to lobby against having their money spent, their tax money spent, for something that they consider evil? Well, I suppose they have a right. They certainly do it. But so have the others. They're only 45% of the population. That's that is not the, the majority. But they have a right to get up and... Certainly. Mm -hmm. I have no objection to their having them say that, but I think we should have the same right. I say we, I mean non-Catholics. Well, of course, this is a little bit at variance with something that you told our reporter earlier this week. You said earlier this week, it's not only wrong, it should be made illegal for any religious group to prohibit dissemination of birth control, even among its own members. In other words, you would like to see the government legislate uh, religious beliefs in a certain sense. Where these strange things come to, uh, that I said them is what I should like to know when. Well now, uh, you know that my reporter spent a good deal of time with you. He's a very accurate young man. Yes. Well, and this, so is a, this is a, this is a <laughs> specific quote. Well, I don't think I could say it quite that way. What are your religious beliefs, Mrs. Sanger? Do you believe in a God in the sense of a divine being who rewards or punishes people after death? Well, I have a different attitude about uh, the divine. I feel that we have divinity within us. And the more we express the good part of our lives, uh, the more the divine within us uh, expresses itself. Uh, I suppose I would call myself an Episcopalian by, uh, by religion. And there's uh, many other, uh, if you've traveled around the world, you get quite a bit of the feeling of uh, all, all religions have so much alike in the divine part of our own being. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you just couldn't put that in a book or you couldn't put it into a, uh, a phrase or a sentence. Do you believe in sin? When I say believe, I don't mean in believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have m disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically, delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things, just mark when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin that people can, can commit. But sin in the ordinary sense that we regard it, do you believe or do you not believe? Well, what? What would they be? Do you believe that infidelity is a sin? Well, I don't, I'm not going to specify what I think is sin. I've stated what I think is the worst sin. The yes, sin. but then you asked me to say what, and I, and I said what, and, I, and, and uh, you refuse to answer me? Ah, yes, I don't know about infidelity. It has so many personalities to it and what a person's own belief is. You can't, I couldn't generalize um, any of those things as, as being sin. Murder is a sin. Well, I naturally think murder is a, well, it's a sin or not. It's a terrible act. In just a moment, Mrs. Sanger, I'd like to ask you about another social problem here in the United States, divorce. Nearly 400,000 couples get divorced in this country each year. And I'd like to get your views on the cause and possible prevention of this problem. But we'll get Mrs. Sanger's answer to that question in just 60 seconds. One look at this cabin cruiser, and you'd know it's new. One puff of this cigarette, and you know it's new. It's Philip Morris, and you'd know by the taste. Philip Morris tastes natural, and that's why smokers like it. And they like the man's kind of mildness in Philip Morris. No filter, no fooling. Nothing artificial between you and the tobacco itself. And the box, here's something else smokers like. It's practical, crush proof. If you haven't smoked a Philip Morris lately, get with it. You'll find a natural taste, a man's kind of mildness, a crush-proof box. Get with Philip Morris.
probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Get with Philip Morris in regular pack or crush proof box, probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Now then, Mrs. Sanger, there are nearly 400,000 divorces or annulments in America each year. What, and this is hard to do in the short time, of course, that we have, what would you recommend to cut down our divorce rate? Well, as a, a great many box clinics are including in the work uh, that they do in birth control clinics, having marriage counseling. So when the woman or the man come and complain of their marriage and the skids, mm -hmm. we invite them to come and have special talks with some of our psychiatrists or others who are making a study of that all over the country, mm -hmm. where we have about 500 clinics. They almost all include uh, marriage counseling and marriage erection. May I, may I ask you this? Could it be that women in the United States have become too independent, that they've followed the lead of women like Margaret Sanger, by neglecting family life for a career. Let me quote from your biography describing your second marriage to Noah Slee. Quote, in New York, Mrs. Sanger maintained every clause of their compact of independence. They had separate apartments. They telephoned each other for dinner or theater engagements or passed notes back and forth. Would you call this a sound formula for marriage, Mrs. Sanger? Uh, different people, yes. It certainly was for me and for my husband. We had a very happy marriage consulting. He had different friends than I had. And uh, I don't believe in forcing. Uh, after all, we were two adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, forcing your friends on uh, another person who may have an entirely different outlook. It worked out very well. I know that it did. You have two sons. One final question. You have two sons. Mm -hmm. How many children have they? Would you like to see them? I would indeed. <laughs> That's one. <wonderful. laughs> How many children? That's six in this family? Five boys to girl in that family. And in the other family? Two girls. Two girls. Mm -hmm. Miss Sanger, I thank you so much for taking time out and coming and talking to us here this evening. And Mr. Wells, I've never smoked, but I'm going to begin to take up smoking and, and use Philip Morris as my, as, as my the cigarette for me to take. <laughs> well, I thank you very much, Mrs. Sanger. Indeed. In the eyes of some, Margaret Sanger has been a heroine. In the eyes of others, she's been a destructive force. The purpose of this interview has been not, of course, to try to resolve this issue, but to open it to a little sensible discussion. This was done with the feeling that all of us, regardless of our beliefs, can do nothing but profit from a free exchange of ideas. I'll bring you a rundown on next week's interview in just a sec 60 seconds or so. These few seconds at the end of the interview were among the most enjoyable of the week for me for much as I enjoy smoking during the interview, Mrs. Sanger. I believe I enjoy this cigarette most right now. Of course, Philip Morris is easy to enjoy. The taste is natural. There's mildness here, too. Today's Philip Morris has what I call a man's kind of mildness. There's no filter, no fooling, no artificial mildness because there is nothing between you and the tobacco itself. Which is why I say, get with Philip Morris. Probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Next week, by popular demand, we're going after more of the opinions, gripes, and philosophy of Frank Lloyd Wright, the revolutionary architect who attacked what he called the mobocracy on this program three weeks ago. This time, we'll find out, among other things, why Mr. Wright says that he has a great affection for the people of the Soviet Union, and we'll get his views at the age of 88 on death and immortality. That's next Saturday night. Till then, for Philip Morris, Mike Wallace, good night. The Mike Wallace interview is brought to you by Philip Morris Incorporated, the quality house. Kings of the Ten Pins meet in match game competition. Watch Bowling Stars every Sunday night on ABC Television Network.